open up your Bible this evening. If you brought it with you, if you didn't, grab the one off the pew right there in front of you, the book of First John. If you go all the way back to the book of Revelation, then you head left, you'll hit it pretty quick. The book of First John, small book, you might miss it. It has a lot to say. You know, when we are heaven-born, we are heaven-bound. And when we are heaven-bound and we're heaven-born and, and God puts an indelible mark on our lives, And so tonight I want to talk about this, the traits of the twice-born, people who have been born again, uh, the birthmarks of the believer. And God wants to tell you that if you don't find these birthmarks, if you don't see this in your life, if you uh, you don't discover these traits, and then what I want you to do tonight is ask yourself, are you really saved? Now, Brother Marcus, are you wanting me to doubt my salvation? Absolutely. If you don't see these traits that we're going to look at tonight, I absolutely want you to examine yourself to to find out maybe you don't have the traits of the twice twice born because you've never been born again. It's one thing to talk religion, and it's another thing to have the real thing with Jesus. I mean, isn't that true? It's easy to say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm saved and all that. Uh, but what I want you to do is look here in the second chapter of 1 John and verse number 4. John says this, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Whoa, man. Uh, listen, John's not, be- John's not beating around the bush, is he? I mean, he is just like, if you say you know Jesus, you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. Right? He's like, yeah, that's right. You say you, you know him, you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. Look at verse number 6 in your Bible. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he, Jesus, walked. Look at verse number 9 in your Bible. He who says he is in the light. Now, we talked about that uh, this morning. Jesus said, I am the light. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. You see how each of those verses begins. He who says, he who says, he who says. It's one thing to talk to talk. It's another thing to walk to walk. And you see, a lot of us talk a good religion, but what people say is not necessarily true, is it? People say all kinds of things. People claim all all sorts of things. uh, The psychiatrist's office, the receptionist came back to the psychiatrist and said, sir, your next appointment's here. And she said, but something strange. And he said, what's that? She says, well, your next appointment's here. And he says that he's invisible. And then the uh, doctor looked at his receptionist. Well, you tell him we can't see him. Okay? Listen, people say all kinds of things. It doesn't mean that it's true. And this is the one area when it comes to being a Christian in faith. People get so, you should have seen your faces when I, when I said that I wanted you to examine your salvation. Your faces are like this. Like, what? Me? Me? Exam- yes, you examine your salvation. God's given us a blueprint here. Not everything that people say is true, but uh, we need to see what these traits are. So what are the traits of the twice born? I'm glad you asked. And here's what, how a true believer will look. When somebody, he who says, she who says, number one, write this down. A true believer submits to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Number one. A true believer submits to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 3 in your Bible. It says, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. No, nobody can be saved apart from receiving Jesus Christ as Lord. As Lord. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The Bible says, If you confess with your mouth that uh, the, the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. His Lordship. You don't receive Jesus as Savior and then some other time down the road receive him as Lord. You receive him as Lord and Savior or you don't receive him at all. That's how it works. And if you say, If Christ is your Lord and you don't keep his word, there's a contradiction. Look in your notes at Luke chapter 6, verse 46. It says, why do you, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? My I was kidding around with my children the other day, and Mark was like, hey, Daddy. I said, don't call me that. Why are you calling me Dad, right? I, I was just kidding around. But Jesus here is saying, why do you, I was kidding, I promise. Why do you call me Lord, I'm going to owe you dinner tonight and before this is over with. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Why do you call him Lord and you won't do the things? Notice it doesn't say believe what he said. 
trust what he said. What did he say? Do not do the things which I say. Lord means master. That means he has rights to command your life. Are you keeping his commandments? Right? Or so I ask you again, are you, are you, are you a child? You know, are you, do you belong to Christ? Well, yes, I do. Do you keep his commandments? Well, I don't know about that. Well, the Apostle John says, you need to examine because the Apostle John says that you're a liar. That's what the Bible says, okay? We think, some reason, and I talked about this a little bit Wednesday night, and I heard somebody else talking about it about a week ago. We seem to think that this faith in following Jesus, that we follow Jesus with our hearts, and you do, and you confess with your mouth, right? But we think that we follow him with our hearts and that we believe what he says, but that doesn't ever equal doing anything, right? It's just, it's just a, personal, a personal relationship. It is a personal relationship, but it's not a private relationship. Okay, um, I, we talked about that Wednesday night. If you weren't here, you missed it. But here's the thing. Here's what I want to say. It's not enough to say I believe Jesus in my heart and therefore I never do what Jesus commanded me to do. Jesus tells us to follow him and to be like him and to act like him, to talk like him, to walk like him. It's not enough just to say what you believe. For instance, if my daughter Amber over here, I'll buy you dinner tonight too, okay? If my daughter Amber over here, if I was to say to her, now Amber, you're to follow me. I want you to act like me, talk like me, walk like me. Right? Uh, I'm your dad, and so I'm going to go in here and clean my room. Also called Alicia's room. Right? We talked about it. Anyway, I'm going to go in here and clean my room. Amber, you go clean your room. Okay? And that's I want you to follow my example. I want you to do what I do. So I go clean my room, and I come out. Amber's standing out in the hallway. And I say, Amber, what are you doing? Did you clean your room? She goes, no. Well, why not? Well, Daddy, you said clean your room and to follow your example. And I've just been sitting here thinking about how glorious you are. Oh, your daddy, you're such a wonderful father. Oh, I'm just, just, oh, I'm just, oh, clean my room. That's so profound. So much, man, though, and daddy, the way you cleaned your room was amazing. I don't think I could ever clean my room that good. But Amber, I told you to do what I said. To follow me, walk like me, talk like me, do what I do. Follow my example. Well, daddy, I know, I know, I know. But what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to get up five minutes early every morning. And I'm going to open up your, your book. And I'm going to find all the places where you said to clean my room. And I'm going to meditate on those. And I'm going to pray those verses of Scripture. Clean my room. Well, wouldn't it be good to clean my room? As a matter of fact, I'm so excited. I'm going to, I'm going to order the latest Beth Moore Bible study. And I'm going to get a small group down there at the church. And we're going to just look at your word and see what our life would look like if I, we would clean our rooms like you cleaned your room. But, but Amber, I wanted you to clean your room. I, I know, I know, I know, no. And that's just wonderful. And Daddy, I, I, whew, and I believe it. I feel it. Oh, man, that, you, Daddy, when you said clean my room, that spoke to me. That spoke to my heart. And then I would say, Amber, why do you call me Father, Father, but you never do the things that I tell you to do? That's how our relationship with Jesus is. We call him Lord, Lord, and we do not do the things which he says. Because, you know what, I believe it in my heart. It speaks to me, but we never do what he calls us to do. Now, are you trying to tell me, Pastor, we got to be perfect to be in heaven? Does Amber have to be perfect to be my daughter? No. No, if it demands perfection, we're all allowed. Nobody's going Right? What this does mean is that he says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. It's all wrapped up in that word keep, keep, to keep something. And there's a couple of ways I want you to look at it. First of all, when you look at that word keep, it means to guard something. If I was going on a trip and I said, hey, I want you to keep this for me while I'm gone, that means it's valuable. That means that it means something to me, right? I want you to keep this. I want you to treasure this. I want you to protect this while I'm gone. I want you to hold on to this for me. That, that's one idea of keep. And then also in the language, it has the picture. It's a nautical word. And what it is, the sailors back then didn't have GPS. I mean, by the way, how do we ever do anything these days without our phone? How did anybody ever have coffee without a cell phone? Amen? Make plans and do things? Uh, anyway. They didn't have GPS like we do now, and so they would follow the stars. And actually, the term for that was keeping the stars. 
So when you're traveling by the stars on a ship, you were keeping the stars. And that just means that a man would set his course by the stars. And so you as a Christian need to set your course in life by keeping the commandments. You treasure those commandments. You steer your life by those commandments. It doesn't mean that you never get off track. It doesn't mean you never take your eyes off the stars. It doesn't mean that you do it perfectly, but the general direction and focus of your life is in following the commandments of God. But I'm here to tell you, if you have no desire in your heart to live by the word of God, if you can sin carelessly, just flippantly, and just without any conviction, you can go your merry way this way, and then God and his word can go this way, then you are not saved. Are you steering by God's word? Are you treasuring God's word? Are you keeping the commandments of God? So why do we do this? Again, we're not saved by keeping the commandments. That's not what saves us. Look at at verse number four. Our teachers here tonight will enjoy this. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Uh, Where it says, he who says, I know him, that's in the perfect tense. The perfect tense. And what that means is this is something that was done in the past. It literally says, he who says, I have known him. That's what that says. He who says, I have known him. And, then, and does not keep his commandments, that's present tense. So what this verse is really saying, it says, because I, it's somebody, the person is, that somebody that would say, because I have known him, I am now keeping his commandments. That's, what, that, that's the person he's addressing. Somebody, because I have known him, I am now keeping the commandments. It doesn't say, but because I am keeping the commandments, I know him. You see the difference? Because I'm keeping his commandments. No, that's not what it says at all. It says, because I know him, I'm keeping his commandments. Don't get it backwards. The only way that you can keep the commandments is to know him. That's the only way this thing works. But if you know him, if you have him in your heart, if you have known him, perfect tense, then you will be keeping his commandments, present tense. You're going to be steering by God's stars. You're going to be treasuring the word of God. And so you need to ask yourself tonight and ask it honestly and be serious with yourself. Do you have in your heart right now an honest desire to live by the word of God? Is the word of God the compass, the stars that you're setting the course of your life on? If not, you need to put a big question mark over this thing that you call salvation. That's what John says. Look at John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. See, if you don't keep his commandments, you don't love them. And if you don't love them, you're not going to keep his commandments. It's really simple. Is that not what Jesus just said in his word? So here's the apostle John, not Marcus. Here's Jesus Christ himself saying, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Treasure them. Right to honor them, to love them, and to set the course of your life by his commandments. Again, I don't keep the commandments in order to be saved. You know, see, Alicia and I, we don't wake up in the morning. And, Ooh, all right, well, it's about breakfast time. Let's feed these kitties. Kitties? I've never said that in my life. These, let's feed these kiddos, these children. You know, it's time for breakfast. We better feed the kids because, you know, if we don't, the Department of Human Services will show up and they'll carry us off to jail because we're not feeding our children, so I guess we'll feed them. Now, we don't feed them because the law says so, right? We love them, therefore, we feed them. We feed them because we love them. We don't keep God's commandments to love him. We love him, therefore, we keep God's commandments. That's how it works. So the first trait of the twice born is they submit to the lordship of christ number two write this down the second trait is this the true believer seeks the lifestyle of jesus seeks the lifestyle of jesus we submit to the lordship of christ and we seek the lifestyle of jesus first john chapter 2 and verse number five look at it it says whoever keeps his word truly the love of god is perfected in him but this we know that we are by this we know that we are in him He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked, as Jesus walked. He's not talking about uh, lordship here necessarily. He's talking about a lifestyle, an everyday life. You submit to his lordship and you seek his lifestyle. You walk as Jesus walked. And being saved doesn't make you more like Christ than you didn't get saved. It's clear in Scripture. 
Being saved makes you like Jesus. It makes you walk as Jesus walked. Now, again, not, you're not perfect. You're not Christ. You're not a little Jesus here tonight. I mean, you, you'll get off course. You'll get off track. But we're talking about a lifestyle. And look at it there in verse 6. It says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he, Jesus, walked. Right? If you got that, if you, if you write in your Bible, underline this phrase right here, just as he. Right? He who says he abides in him ought himself ought to walk just as he, Jesus, walked. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. It says, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, what does this lifestyle, I'm talking about this lifestyle, what does it look like? Now, here's some basic things that we really we get all of it out of 1 John. It's a life of, write this down, A, a life of honesty. This is simple stuff. Honesty, just telling the truth. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 7, the second part of that verse says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship with one another. Now, go up to verse number 6. It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Why did we say this morning? Jesus said, I am the light. Those who follow me will never walk in darkness again. So the lifestyle of Christ is a lifestyle of honesty. I'm honest with God, I'm honest with myself, and I'm honest with others. I'm honest with you. If you've got a life that's built on dishonesty, you're not walking as Jesus walked. You're not walking in the light. You're walking in the darkness. And Scripture says the truth is not in you. And if you're not walking in the light, you have no right to call yourself a child of God. It's a life of honesty. But B, write this down. It's also a life of purity. Purity. It's honesty and purity. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. It says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. Don't miss that phrase, just as he is. My life is to have the lifestyle of Jesus. It's more than just being honest. Uh, his lifestyle was a lifestyle of purity. If you're feeding on filth and your heart's full of filth and, and debauchery, you can, don't call yourself a child of God. You can't live that way forever and be saved. You can get off track. You can get off course. But there's nothing in your heart that desires to live by the commandments of God. You don't belong to the king. Again, I'm not saying you cannot slip into sin. But if this is your lifestyle, you're not walking as Jesus walked, period. There's, there's no picture of, in Scripture of a believer that can live in sin forever, indefinitely, and is actually a real uh, follower of Christ. I mean, can you imagine Jesus watching some of the things that's on TV today or listening to some of the things that he had listened to? I can't. So C, write this down also, it's the life of righteousness righteousness his life was a life of honesty his life was a life of purity and his life was a life of righteousness now that verse says even as he's pure and you're saying well isn't that the same thing look at verse number seven it says little children let no one deceive you he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous see jesus is honest jesus is pure but jesus practiced righteousness Okay, so what is that? Righteousness is not merely uh, the, the, uh, abstaining from doing something wrong. Righteousness is doing something right. Uh, it said of Jesus Christ that he went about what? Doing good. That's what Scripture tells us. He just went about doing good. Now you say, Pastor, when I submit to the Lordship of Jesus, how do I seek out this lifestyle of Jesus? The key is in verse number 6 in chapter 2. Look at it. It says, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And you see this in Scripture a lot, abiding, abiding, abiding. Uh, it's easy to understand. Jesus is really simple. I think we make it complicated. He's not very hard to understand what he wants from us. John 15 and verse 5 says this. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do Nothing. So what it means to abide means to uh, depend upon Jesus the way a branch uh, will depend upon the vine, the grapevine. Just like the, the branch can do nothing without the vine, we can do nothing without Jesus. The branch is totally and completely dependent upon the vine. We are to be totally and completely dependent upon Jesus. The branch does not even produce the, the fruit. It bears the, the fruit. Same thing for us. We're not producing fruit good works we're bearing the good works that christ jesus does through us abiding is a lifestyle of dependence upon jesus that's how you do it 
Uh, Jesus set the example when he came here as a man and lived among us. People, people even asked Jesus, Jesus, how do you do the things that you do? How do you do the miracles that you work? How, how do you do these things? And he always pointed to the Father. He'd say, well, I'm not doing this. The Father does it. Well, I only say what the Father says. I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only do what I see the Father doing. That's abiding. That's absolute dependence that he modeled for us when he lived here. So if you're going to live a lifestyle of uh, the same lifestyle of Jesus Christ, you're going to have to abide. You're going to have to depend upon him. And when you abide, abide in him, when you are to Jesus what Jesus was to the Father, Jesus will be to you what the Father was to him when he walked among us. And to be, remember those... Remember years ago, the big thing, what would Jesus do, WWJD, right? I thought that was great. I mean, but it's just a little bit more complicated than that, right? For, you know, what would Jesus do? I, mean, I think it's a wonderful thing to ask yourself, but first of all, you're kind of assuming that you know what Jesus would do in any given situation. If you read the New Testament, if you read the Gospels, what you'll see is that Jesus often did the exact opposite of what everybody thought he was going to do. We talked about this morning, you know, they... Uh, you know, I'm sure there are people in that crowd that thought Jesus was going to stone that woman to death, but he didn't. So he's always confounding and confusing people with what he's going to do. Uh, and also, it kind of presumes that if you did know what Jesus was going to do, that you could do it. Well, you know, uh, that's a, I can come to the plate in and, and a Major League Baseball, and I can have a, a bat and a uniform, and I can watch that pitcher throw that ball right at me at 100 miles an hour, and I can set up and I can ask myself, what would Mark McGuire do? Now, if I ask myself, what would Mark McGuire do in this situation, does it necessarily mean that I can do what Mark McGuire would do in that situation? I mean, not necessarily, but we know that Christ Jesus works through us in a powerful way. And then often I hear people, you know, what would Jesus do if he, is he, if he was here? Well, Jesus is here. He's with you. He's alive in us. And, and that's the answer to this. What would Jesus do? We need to let Jesus be Jesus in us and through us. Uh, living the Christian life is a supernatural reliance upon the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one person who's ever lived the Christian life, and that's Jesus. He's the only one that ever could. And if he, listen, if the Christian life is being lived in your home, that's just Christ Jesus doing it there through you. You walk as he walked because you abide. You depend upon him. Now, the third thing, write this down, the third trait of the twice, twice born, you show the love of Jesus. True believers are going to show the love of Jesus. You submit to his lordship, you seek his lifestyle, and also you show his love. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 10, it says, He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. You just simply share his love. The, the commandment to love is old and new, right? It was the first and greatest commandment. And then Jesus also said this in John 13, 34. He said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And, and again, Jesus said that in John 13. You remember what Jesus just did uh, before John chapter 13, verse number 34? He just washed those disciples' feet. Will, you come on up here, but we're going to show them one. No, not this time. Okay, thank you. He, he washed those nasty old, dirty old disciples' feet. I mean, and you think they were lovely? And he doesn't. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Think about who was in that room. I mean, it wasn't that great. You think Peter was lovely and wonderful? That big mouth, arrogant, crude. James and John, the sons of thunder? I promise you, that was not a compliment. Oh, those sons of thunder, right? They had a hair-trigger temper. What matter? James and John, read it. Just find it yourself. James and John were in Samaria, and they didn't like what was going on, and they said, well, Jesus, how about it? How about we just nuke this whole town? Yeah, they said, Jesus, how about we just call down fire from heaven and just wipe them out? I mean, these are the sons of thunder. I mean, they mean it. They wanted some heavenly napalm. You, you know what I'm saying? And so these guys, they're not that great. Simon the Zealot, I mean, he's Andrew. Uh, Andrew's quiet and sensitive. Philip, calculating Philip. Old, cynical, sarcastic, doubting Thomas is in there. And, of course, the betrayer Judas is in that room as well. And let me tell you something. Jesus doesn't love us because we're lovely. He loves us because he chose to. 
And you look around this room, we just run down that list, but do you think you're all so lovable? <laughs> Welcome to Bethel. Do you think you're all so lovely and lovable? You know, if you, uh, statistics say that one out of three people are beautiful and handsome. So if, if there's two people sitting beside you, look to your left, look to your right. And if they're not, you are. Congratulations, okay? You're beautiful or handsome. But we're not, right? We, we uh, are dependent upon Christ because he loves us, not because we're lovely or there's something great about us. It's because how great he is. So what are the traits of the twice-born? We submit to his lordship, we seek his lifestyle, and we show his love. If those things aren't in your heart, you should stop calling yourself a Christian and reevaluate and get, get right with God. Think about the Holocaust. The millions, the Holocaust anniversary was just this past week. The millions of Jews who lost their lives. There's that one at camp I never even heard of. Alicia was watching this documentary on television because they completely destroyed it and tried to hide the fact that it even existed. And they would bring these Jews in into Poland and they'd get off the train. And when they got off the train, within an hour, they were dead. Right, they bring them in, bring them through this thing. Oh, get rid of your, you know, strip down here. We're going to de, de, de you. We're going to clean you up and then uh, take off all your watches and everything here. Oh, go through here. We're going to get you in a shower. And they take them back there and they kill them. And they, and they killed hundreds of thousands at this one uh, camp that I never even heard of. And they killed millions of Jews. Do you know who did that? A Christian nation called Germany. Before World War II, I promise you, if, if our international mission board was to do a, a survey and tell you which countries were Christian, which ones were Muslim, which ones are Hindu or whatever, they would have labeled Germany as a Christian nation. Let me tell you something. Christian people never take part in anything like that. Would they? No. That, those are people who are saying, I know him but they're lying. They don't know him. You're not saved by keeping the commandments. You're not saved by walking like Jesus walked. You're not saved by loving your brother and sister. If you are saved, you're going to do those things, but that's not what saves you. They flow out of a life that has met Jesus. And if your religion hasn't changed your life, you need to change your religion because you don't have New Testament Christianity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you'll help us to uh, match up our walk with our talk. And Lord, that uh, it'll be genuine. Uh, that, we, that what we might say uh, will match up with reality. Listen, every head bowed, every eye closed, no looking around. Why don't you just pray right there where you're at? Why don't you just uh, evaluate yourself? Say, Lord, if there's uh, an area in my life where I need to come clean with you and get right and surrender to your lordship, I'm going to do that right now. But maybe tonight you've just come to realize, I've been saying, yes, I'm a Christian. But none of these things really resonate in my life or in my heart. But if you'd like to trust Christ Jesus, you can do that tonight. You can just pray sincerely to God and ask Him to come into your life to save you of your sins. You can say, dear God, I know that you love me. Why don't you pray that if that's you? There's no shame in that. Don't allow, don't allow embarrassment to keep you from going to heaven. Spend an eternity in hell for a thing called pride. Don't do it. Just pray and say, dear God, I know that you love me, and I know that you want to save me. And friend, He does. He wants to save you. He died to save you. He longs to save you. Just pray. Say, Lord, I know that you want to save me. You died to save me. You promised to save me if I would trust you. Just tell him right now. Say, Lord, I'm trusting you. I I'm putting a nail in this. I'm settling this once and forever. I trust you right now, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Master Jesus. Lord, at this moment, with all of my heart, I repent of my sin and I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin, Lord Jesus. Pray that to mean it tonight. Say, Lord Jesus, save me. And then if that was you, if you prayed that, then just pray again. Say, Lord, thank you for doing it. I receive it by faith according to your word. I'm not looking for a sign. I'm not asking for a, a special feeling. Lord, I'm just going to stand on the promises in your 
word. Thank you for saving me. Lord, begin now making me the new person that you want to be in your holy name. Listen, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart and you were sincere with God, he saved you just now. And we'd love to celebrate with you. Why don't you come and make it public? I'd love to pray with you. Maybe there's some other need in your life right now. As we look at these traits of the twice born, these traits of true believers, and you notice, you know, God kind of pricked your conscience a little bit. There's an area, oh, Lord, you know what? I've been drifting. I haven't been keeping the stars. I haven't been keeping your commands like I should. Why don't you come to him tonight and ask him for forgiveness and walk out of here with all your sins forgiven and in a right relationship with God. Whatever the need is tonight, do business with God. Father God, we love you so much. Thank you for the privilege of coming here and worshiping you through song and your word. Lord, I just pray that we'll continue to do that during this invitation time. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.